Welcome to The Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on high-performance computing. Today, my guest is John Gustafson. He is, of course, the uh, father of Gustafson's Law, among other things, but he's also the author of a new book. It's called The End of Error, Unum Computing. So, John, what can you tell us about this? I, well, I'm going to talk about a new uh, way to do computation on computers, any numeric computation that is more energy efficient and gets much better answers, which is, I think, what we really most need right now. Yeah. Well, well John, this is exciting. You know, you, I think you and I have been talking about this for a couple of years, and uh, <laughs> I, I, I remember at the time when you first brought it up that uh, you weren't able to break it at the time, and you were very excited that, you know, that, that seemed to be your next step. So, so what, what was the genesis of this? Well, I was always trying to fix all the traditional problems with things like uh, interval arithmetic that promised that they were going to get valid answers and guaranteed answers and uh, you won't have to know numerical analysis anymore. And they just didn't work. Everything had, had something wrong with it. Uh, everything had a gotcha. And I finally found one that didn't have any gotchas, and that's when I <laughs> got so excited. Well, cool. So, uh, so tell me about the book. I mean, you, you did two things here, right? You came up with this new method, and then you had to, mm -hmm. you know... Uh, go through that whole author process, didn't you? Yes, that's right. And uh, CRC Press has uh, consented to do the book, and they did it in 400 pages of full color, which is very generous of them. So I was <laughs> able to use a lot of color illustrations to make the points clear. But uh, I, I wanted to have enough examples of how it actually works that it wouldn't look like it was just a special case where only in this case or that case does it work better than existing floating point arithmetic. It really completely covers the entire field. And, and I remember us talking about how you wanted to give this to the community, basically, this, this new uh, way of doing things. It, did, were you able to open source it, or how did you go about that process? Yes, I actually, uh, they're, we're giving away the in, uh, development environment, which is written in Mathematica, uh -huh. and it very clearly has an MIT license on it that uh, gives it away, says you can, use, you can sub-license it, you can sell it, you can give it away for free, you just can't sue me for anything that goes wrong. That's about <laughs> the only thing you can't do. <laughs> okay, but it does get the right answers, right? I mean, that's the it, whole point, it, right? Yeah. Well, it gives it gives bounds on answers if it can't get you the exact answer, ah. and th that's the real thing: is that you know when you and right now floats have no indication of when they're exact and when they're not, and so mm -hmm. you, they're very treacherous. Yeah. yeah, and people don't realize just how dangerous they are to use for serious calculations. Well, great. Well, why don't we go into it, John? You've got a lot of slides here, and I, I've sure. got them up on our screen, and I'll just follow along and let, let's learn some more. Okay, well, the title is An Energy Efficient and Massively Parallel Approach to Valid Numerics. I didn't want to use the jargon term, but it could have a subtitle of Unum Computing. Yeah. So the big problems facing computing on the second slide, let me just flip, flip through them. I think we all know what these are. There's too much energy and power needed per calculation. We're all, we run out of electricity before we run out of floor space or money yeah. when we're building a big supercomputer. Sure. We've also got a lot more hardware parallelism than we know how to use. We've got, like, people are proposing 10 billion processors or 10 billion core machines for the exascale. And I rarely see people use more than a few hundred on a, a given job. Sure. There's also not enough bandwidth, and this has just been getting <laughs> worse uh, as long as you and I have been in supercomputing, Rich. It's just uh, people keep complaining that they'd never get enough I.O. to keep the arithmetic busy, and it's actually getting worse every year. Yeah. Rounding errors are really a lot more dangerous than people realize. They think it's something over in the, the last few decimal places, but sometimes it can be in the very first decimal place. And when you have these rounding errors, it has a subtle effect that when you rewrite something to run in parallel, you get a slightly different answer or sometimes a much different answer. And that means people go back to the serial method because that's the one they trust. They don't understand what's going on. They don't know whether they made a bug or whether they are just getting rounding error. Yeah. And then there's another kind of aspect to this, which is all the numerical methods that we have. The sampling errors in numerical methods are the other kind of error that I'm trying to eliminate. And when you're doing a physical simulation, you're just kind of guessing your way through time steps, and you get advice, and you always want more accuracy, but it's not a proof that anything's going to happen. It's just guesswork. And these, all these numerical methods that we've piled up over the years are really, it's just like a bunch of recipes. And so you have to be an expert and know exactly which recipe to use in which situation. And that's not a very good situation for programmer productivity either. And there's a, a final problem with the IEEE floating point standards. People don't realize that it gives different answers on different platforms. There's nothing in that standard that assures you you're going to get the same bitwise identical result on different machines, partly because there's all these different optional things you can or cannot, you don't have to support. 
And that's <laughs> it's really it's more like a, the IEEE advice list as instead of a standard. Now, if you take a look at on the next slide, the ones vendors care most about, they definitely care about energy and power and about not having enough bandwidth. Um, and the fact that people aren't going parallel because of they, they don't understand what's happening to their answers. And the, it's a pain in the butt that the IEEE floats give different answers on different platforms. But I find it's very difficult to convince computer company executives that they need to get better answers. What they do care about is energy and power. Yeah. So what I was looking for was something where, yeah, so you can convince them that, the, you know, we want more battery life or we want to use fewer megawatts in the data center. That they're interested in. But they don't hear anybody complaining that they're getting wrong answers. Well, <laughs> that's because we think it's kind of a hopeless thing to deal with, and it's not hopeless at all. We can actually fix both things at once. So in the next slide, there's just way too much power and heat needed. You see these heat sinks? I mean, they're hundreds, even thousands of times bigger than the chip that they cool these days. So when yeah. you talk about a tiny little integrated circuit, you've really got uh, uh, many ounces of cooling and uh, equipment that, and airspace that has to go with that. Uh, right now, the DOE has proposed a 20 megawatt limit on an exascale computer just because there has to be a power budget, and making people work within that constraint is, is both reasonable and good discipline. Uh, but I know that when Microsoft puts a big data center up or, or, or Google, they easily spend tens of millions of dollars just on the electricity for a data center like that one shown in the lower right. Yeah. Of course, everybody worries about their battery life, um, the cell phones, the tablets. Um, believe it or not, even... <laughs> Even something like Angry Birds uses uh, too much electricity because it's it's doing things with floating point that it doesn't need to. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so this is a very broad application area. Uh, when you get, of course, a lot of heat, it means you have to make the machine bigger or else it'll melt. And yeah. as soon as you make things bigger, yeah, you've got less of a supercomputer because that increases the latency, and latency limits your speed. We're all up against the speed of light. And the only real way to beat the speed of light right now is to put things closer together. And you can't put them closer together because of the heat. Yeah. So next slide has got a beautiful picture I got from Jack Dongara of the Tianhe 2 supercomputer in China. And I think that's right now still the number one on uh, the Linpack list, HPL, for yes. top 500. Yes, it is. And, uh, yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it, all these big clusters just get split up into partitions. They run Linpack, they get their press release, and then they're immediately used for smaller jobs because very few times do we know how to use all of those cores, all those servers on a single problem for a single question. And uh, so what used to be capability machines are turning into capacity machines, and that's not a substitute. And you take a look at the, in the next slide, I've got a table about not enough bandwidth, the memory wall, and this is uh, from a couple years ago, data I got from Intel. Uh, the amount of time and the amount of energy needed to do things like the arithmetic. And this is kind of counterintuitive because you'd think to multiply two 15-digit numbers together and add another 15-digit number would take a long time compared to writing them down because that's our human experience. But in fact, it's just the backwards for, uh, for, for modern computers. They can go hundreds of times faster at doing the multiplies and adds than just moving the data around. And that's where all the energy is, too. I mean, if you actually have to go off the chip to DRAM, that's the expensive part. Now you're talking about nanojoules, not picojoules. And it takes like 70 times longer than to, to actually do the arithmetic. So your intuition is wrong if you think that the work is in the multiplies and the adds and that the goal should be more flops. It's really a data motion that's, that's counting every, everything. So that's what got me thinking. Is there a way to represent numbers that make every bit count and make them more representative? Now, uh, if, you, if you see that at the bottom of the slide there, uh, 1,200 picojoules at 3 gigahertz, that's 36 watts. So that's already about a third of the total power consumption of a chip. And a lot of that is because we're using 64-bit precision everywhere. We just throw double precision at a problem and say, I'm not sure, I don't have any numerical analysis experts on my team. Let's just use double precision, cross our fingers, and hope for the best. But that's one size fits all. It's overkill, and it really wastes everything. And we got to stop doing that. So the next slide has got a birthday cake for floating point. Maybe you should say 1.01 .01 times 10 to the second now, because it's 19, it's 2015. Yeah. But believe it or not, <laughs> our, our current standards for floating point, I mean, come from a, an idea from 1914. Leonardo E. Torres Equivado. I think was uh, the guy who proposed having a fraction of scaling factor on automatic computing equipment. 
So here we are still using a format designed for World War I hardware capabilities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty ridiculous. Yes. Now, uh, back in those days, and you think people... You go to the next slide, and I got a picture of the uh, Silent Speed Marchant calculator, the desktop calculator. You saw everything you were doing with your calculations was right in front of you. And when you rounded or you ran out of digits or you overflowed, you knew it. And you could do something to correct for it because you were painstakingly going through every calculation, typing in the numbers by hand. But, you know, when you, you actually go automatic and you start doing uh, millions of calculations per second or trillions nowadays, then... Uh, you don't know what's going on, and you just hope that somebody a long time ago did the analysis to figure out that it was safe to do that. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Now, there's flags on processors. Um, in the IEEE standard, there's something called the inexact bit, there's the overflow bit, the underflow bit. There's things like that that are stored in the processor. Where are those? I mean, Rich, have you ever seen a language that lets you get to the overflow bit on a <laughs> processor? Yeah, no, they don't dive down that deep, do they? No, no, it's not in C. It's not <laughs> yeah. in. I mean, even, you'd have to go to assembler uh, in order to figure out a way to find out what's that processor flag doing, and you'd have to do it after every operation. So yeah. that hasn't worked. The other thing about these uh, floats is that they don't obey the laws of algebra. There's a big difference between real math and floating point. It just uh, and and knowing what the exceptions are is 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 hard. Now there's something called a NAN. That's not a number, uh, and you need a couple of different examples of not a number, like when you uh, divide by zero or you take the square root of negative one. You, you want to do either. You either want to stop the computer or you want to keep on going but say that's, that's nonsense and it's going to be nonsense from now on, and I'll give you a nonsense answer. Mm -hmm. You only really need two different kinds of NAN. Well, floats have billions, depending on the precision, trillions of kinds of NANs, and they're all different bit patterns that could be used for real information, but instead they're redundantly expressing a nonsense number. Hmm. Huh. Yeah, that's something I found out just in the last few years, too. The, uh, you, you really notice it when you go down to low precision, like half-precision floats, uh -huh. and you, you find you're wasting 6% of the bit patterns just representing NAN, and you'd like to have some more numbers in there. And as I said before, the IEEE 74 standard is really a guideline because of all the optional rules spoiling consistent results. So let me give you an analogy for printing. I mean, uh, if you're old enough to remember when printouts look like they do on the left-hand side uh, here, yeah. uh, 30 seconds per page, yeah, remember those? Oh, yeah. Big capital letters, uh, right. Right, Fan my old paper. machine, uh, that's how you interfaced with the device. Was these <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You waited for this thing to come out. And you had like a six, uh, what is it, 80 characters across and 66 lines down. Mm -hmm. And all you had was capital letters and numbers and uh, punctuation, and it all had to be monospaced. Yeah. And you waited about 30 seconds for a printout. Now, when IBM uh, realized they could use lasers to print uh, pages, all a page at a time, their vision was that it, they would do exactly what you see here with the blarky, ugly-looking capital letters, mm -hmm. and but they'd produce three pages per second. Ah. And they actually built laser printers that did that. But what do we have now? Well, <laughs> yeah. we've got... Modern printers print about 30 seconds per page, but they print beautiful stuff with color, full color, full bleed, both sides, and uh, all the different fonts you could possibly imagine. That's what we did with the speed. Now, why is it we can't do that with numbers? Hmm. I mean, why, why is it that we can't have better representations for arithmetic that make use of this higher speed of computers to do some of the numerical analysis for us and, and track their own accuracy? And, and, and actually relieve some of these other problems. So I have a kind of a funny slide here, a receipt from a retailer. I yep. uh, see somebody tried to use floating point. <laughs> yeah. <just> sad. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. Can you imagine getting a receipt like that with yeah. 15 decimals and what you owe? But uh, people don't know when to use fixed point, when to use floating point, and they just reach for something. Yeah. Okay. So I, talking about the, the floats again, how they prevent the use of parallelism, yeah. The associative laws, what's shown here, you know, A plus B plus C plus D, how you group that, uh, in floats, it matters a lot. Of course, it shouldn't matter mathematically, mm -hmm. but you'll get a different answer in general when you put that in parallel. Interesting. And so people, th yeah, people think the parallel answer is always the wrong one. They don't trust that one. Mm -hmm. It's actually usually ac has less error in it than the uh, serial answer. Oh. But uh, so they go back. And so 
you think about Intel trying so hard to persuade people to accept multi-core, and even with two cores, you can get into trouble like this where you get a, uh, a change in the answer. Hmm. So let me show you that. that my, my signature page is this picture of the ocean with uh, the volcano erupting on it. You see there? A yeah. new number format, the unum. And I'll tell you why I use that picture in a second. So I call these things unums because it's short for universal numbers. So mm. the, way, uh, the word bit is short for binary digit. I guess people have forgotten where that came from. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's a superset of all of the IEEE floating points, for both the 754 standard and the new 1788 interval standard, but it's a lot more than that. Uh, so it has all the different precisions and way beyond. Mm. Both, both smaller precisions and larger precisions, than, uh, smaller than half precision and larger than quad precision floats, and by very, very similar rules for operation. So it's kind of a logical progression that in computer history that we've gone from integers to floats and now to unums. And the remarkable thing about these is they don't round. They don't overflow. Mm -hmm. They don't underflow. They don't do any of the things you're, you usually associate with, with floats getting you the wrong answers. And they obey the laws of algebra because they've got some extra fields to annotate what's going on. Hmm. That makes them safe to parallelize. And this is a remarkable thing, too, is that even though you've added some description to the, the field, it actually takes fewer bits on the average than a floating point number. So why don't we use these? Well, they're new. Yeah. And some people don't like new. <laughs> I mean, yeah. At Intel, they said, you can't boil the ocean when I propose something like this. Mm. And uh, hmm. so I went to the web and, and, and Googled bo boiling the ocean. And I discovered there's all kinds of ocean boiling going on. You sure. certainly can. <laughs> there you go. Well, well, John, let me ask you, are we talking about intervals here? Is that what this is based on? Uh. Well, intervals are one thing you can represent, but yes. uh, it, with classic interval arithmetic, you have a closed uh, number range, yeah. like A to B, like 2 to 3, yes. and it's all the, the numbers from 2 to 3 inclusive. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you want an open interval, and sometimes you want a half-open interval, and mm -hmm. sometimes you want an exact number. Mm -hmm. And if, if you just add one bit, it turns out, to, my rep to the representation, you can encompass all of those possibilities with very economic storage, and it's an option whether you work with intervals or not. You don't have to. Uh -huh. But when you do work with intervals, I can do it in less than half as many bits as current interval arithmetic. And I don't get nearly the explosion of range that you get with interval arithmetic. That's yeah. the real problem. Uh -huh. Interesting. Every time, people always try interval arithmetic once, and that's the last time they ever <laughs> try it. Yeah. They, yeah. The answer comes out, oh, your answer is somewhere between minus infinity and infinity. And you say, thank <laughs> you very much. I think yeah. I'll go back to using floats now. So... Yeah. The the breakthrough was, was finding a, a raft of ways to make sure that does not happen mm. and that you still get tight bounds and you don't have to be an expert in order to get those tight bounds. Mm -hmm. So let, let me just show you how why these things are more economic with uh, three ways to express a big number. Avogadro's number yeah. is like 6 times 10 to the 23rd atoms or molecules, mm -hmm. uh, kind of a standard chemist big number there. And if you had to write that with an integer, look how many bits it would take you. It would take like 80 bits, lots of digits. Yeah. But now with a, an IEEE standard float, even though you've added a field to say, here's, here's the exponent, here's the scale factor, yeah. it actually saves you bits. Because now you don't have all those nasty trailing zeros. Yeah. Okay, next step is the unum, which only takes 29 bits. And you see those three extra fields over there on the right? There's a magenta field called the U bit. That's yeah. the uncertainty bit. Uh -huh. There's the size of the exponent in bits, and there's a fraction size. And that is self-descriptive bits that track and manage the uncertainty and let you actually automate the process of adjusting the precision to whatever accuracy you're trying to get. Hmm. And there have been things a little bit like this before, like significance arithmetic and, and, and radius arithmetic. And I, I've gone through them all, and mm -hmm. I've, they all have bugs, <laughs> let me tell yeah. you. <laughs> yes. um, this is the first one I was able to reduce to, to a, a mathematically perfect uh, closed set even when it's only got four bits in the total expression for the number. Ooh. And that's an awfully small floating point number is four bits. <laughs> yeah. Well, John, but are, it still you, are, works. You, are we limited by that exponent size there? Uh, or that's just the expression for this particular uh, number? Uh, well, 
you you set the environment as to how many bits you want in that green and the gray field, yeah. and you can keep that throughout the application, or you can change it during the application, mm. but that label then goes with that block of numbers, sort of like we right now we keep track of whether a, number is, a bunch of numbers are single precision or this whole block of numbers is double precision. Mm. So generally speaking, if you just add like 11 bits uh, to the end of the number, you can do all of the floating point types and all the integer types and a whole lot of different... Uh, 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 fixed point types as well. Mm -hmm. Wow. So on the next slide, I say why unums use fewer bits than floats. Yeah. And the exponent is generally the wasteful part of a floating point number because you've got these huge ranges that they're capable of expressing, like 600 orders of magnitude in double precision. Yeah. You really usually only need maybe 20. Mm -hmm. And sometimes your temporary values go up, but immediately the, the result goes back down. Like you square a number, add it to another, and then take a square root. So... The, the dynamic range really isn't that big in the final result. But you can also get rid of all the trailing zeros in the fraction. Mm -hmm. And when you have more common values, like when you use uh, just a floating point number to represent a half or negative one, then those can take very, very short strings of bits. And when you subtract two similar numbers, it, can't, it actually cancels a lot of similar bits. Well, these things automatically then shrink. So they reflect the fact that there's been cancellation, which informs the, the user and informs the computer that there's been loss of significance, mm -hmm. but it tracks exactly what that loss is. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So I've got a graph of what the difference is kind of as a, this is kind of a, a peculiar graph to explain uh, with these ranges as well as exact points on the next slide. Yeah. Uh, yeah, here's, here's a bunch of magenta points. And what you're doing with most floating point representation is you're picking an exact number. It's a rational number that you, you, you are representing with a, an exponent and a fraction. And in the case of uh, unums, what you're doing is you're alternating between exact numbers and the interval between exact numbers. Mm. So if the last bit, the uncertainty bit, is a 1, then it's a lot like the dot, dot, dot you write when you write 3.14 dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Yeah, you're saying that, that's not exactly pi. Pi is 3.14 dot, dot, dot. Right. It's not exact. There's more digits after that. Mm -hmm. So all it takes is one bit to say there's a dot, 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 and it completely covers the interval between uh, 3.14 and 3.15. Yeah, yeah. So, so to, if I, don't, uh, I leave that bit off, yeah. Go ahead. To uh, what we used to call, what, significant digits, right? We just Yeah. But, but we acknowledge that they're there. And yeah, yeah, and people have asked me, well, why don't we just add that bit to the end of the fraction, like I, I do, and, and mm -hmm. not have all that other fancy stuff, but it's going to be floating back and forth. You see, mm -hmm. just, as the, just as the exponent floats in the floating point number, the significant floats, how many significant digits you have floats, too, in a unum. Yeah. And so you have to be able to track it, and that's why you need all three of those fields. Interesting. So that, oddly enough, gives you representation of all real numbers with a finite number of bits. It's not that they're exact, but yeah. I completely cover the the real number line from minus infinity to infinity. I have special bit strings for infinity and minus infinity because those aren't really real numbers. Mm -hmm. But uh, they behave very nicely in this format and, and still are closed under it. And then, of course, two more for the NAND numbers. You see I've got just one bit string means uh, silent NAND or signaling, and then another one means signaling NAND, means stop the calculation. I've mm -hmm. got a, a black NAND and a red NAND there. Yeah, yeah. So here's how you do intervals on the next page. They're called U-bounds because you can make open-ended or closed-ended intervals. And that's very powerful mathematically because right now we don't have a way of expressing sets of real numbers on a computer. I mean, you could haul up something like Mathematica or Maple. Yeah. But if I say, show me all the numbers that are bigger than 3, uh -huh. how do you express that? Well, interval arithmetic would say 3 comma infinity, but it would include the three. I said, oh, wait, I, mean, I said bigger than three, <laughs> and right. you lied. You did. Yeah. yeah. So uh, if you can't do think, simple things like intersect and union and complement, mm -hmm. then you don't really have a, much of a number system. And so with unums, you have a closed number system under set operations. And that's got all the, the plus or minus infinities and the empty set and mm -hmm. quiet and signaling NAN. So... The, I, I distinguish between, uh, on the next slide, the three layers of computing, because there's the layer that we understand as humans, and it's not necessarily printouts of numbers. They don't have to be decimals. It could be you know, uh, the, the output you see from a video game or the sensation you get in your steering wheel when you're driving a car. It's yeah. all kinds of ways we use real numbers. 
but it's it's what the point where they're perceived. Mm-hmm. And uh, we have our own grammar for expressing exact and inexact, like I said, the dot, 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 or yes. the maybe the little plus sign. Mm-hmm. But now you go to a computer, and a computer has its representation, which right now is floats, but I'm proposing what I call the U-layer, which is all unums and U-bounds, and they're very high-efficiency uh, ways of computing with floats and with real-valued intervals. But every computer has a scratch pad hidden in it. They all do, and they don't tell you what they're doing, but like when you do a multiply of a double precision number, it actually does the multiplication to 106 bits of fraction. Then it rounds and gives you the 53. Hmm. So that's all going on behind the curtain. And uh, the lack of standardization in that is what causes bitwise different results. So what I've done is I've standardized what I call the G layer, which is real mathematical general intervals. And if you do that... It solves all kinds of problems with parallel processing, giving different answers. They don't give different answers anymore. It doesn't matter how you order the answers because it's mathematics instead mm-hmm. of floats. And it uh, it allows you to produce a standard that finally, for the first time, is a real standard where you, you get exactly the same answer on all different computers just like you do right now with integers. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of revolutionary. And we've always wanted that. Never had it. Right. Now, on the next slide, I've got a picture of the Worrell Piri. The Worrell Piri are an Aboriginal people in Australia, northern Australia. And when they first had contact with other civilizations, they could count to two. Anything more than two was many. So they just said, one, two, many. many. I, I always thought that was funny. <laughs> first heard about them in the Guinness Book of World Records, the world's smallest uh, society for mathematical counting numbers. But, uh, well, let's see, what can you do with... One, two, and many. Well, you've also got need one, need two, and need many. So there's mm-hmm. negative numbers, and you've got something. Uh, surely they've got a word for none, and they've got a word for all, mm-hmm. and maybe a word for, for nonsense, junk, and stop. I, I got it covered. Yeah. <laughs> I'll add few and some, and now I've got the whole real number line represented down there on the bottom. And guess what? It follows the floating point convention for what a hidden bit does and a signed bit, and now I've added the uncertainty bit, the magenta one on the end, and I can cover the whole real number line in four bits. Four bits. And this, that's, that sucker is closed. It, it is very neat and, and clean under floating point operations. It's not very accurate, but mm-hmm. it, it, it never lies to you. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. It doesn't round. Uh, and the next one, I've got a more of a real-sized uh, unum that's also fixed size. People are frightened by the fact that these are variable size. They say, oh, we're going to have to manage strings of bits, and it's going to yeah. be really hard. Uh, they don't have to be variable sized. They can be easily compressed without loss when you want to get rid of all the crud. Mm-hmm. But uh, if you want to expand them into a 64-bit register, then you can still save energy because you only use a fraction of the bits. Uh, and you know which bits are being used, and you can turn off the other ones. So CPU designers are pretty good about figuring out how to, how to do something about that. Yeah. But because you've got bits left over, um, you can have summary bits. Over there on the left, you see, is this number less than zero? Is it a, a nonsense number? Is it a, one of the infinities? Uh, things like that. Mm-hmm. Or is it, is it half of an interval? Is there another number associated with this value? And that sounds like a, a funny thing to do, just have a, a single bit for all those, but it's like a, it's like a warning label on the number, mm-hmm. and all you have to do is check one bit. Now, on the bottom, I've got the circuit required for the question, uh, is this an IEEE uh, 16-bit float that equal to infinity? Mm-hmm. You actually have to go through that AND tree of all the input bits on 16 bits yeah. in order to figure out if it, that is exactly the bit pattern for in positive infinity. That's a lot but, of energy uh, going through yes. all those gates, it, right? Yeah. Yes, and it's a lot of clock delays, too. Mm-hmm. And that's just half precision. Yeah. But it's like 30 times less energy and space on the chip to do it for an expanded unum here where you just test the single bit. And you can maintain these uh, unpacked bits very, very easily from one operation to another. So uh, for, in some ways, it's making things much faster on chip as well as reducing the, the, the traffic of bits to and from memory. So, once I got these things done, I, I well, let me tell you about the, the Wrath of Khan. Now, that's actually the way William Khan pronounces his name. <laughs> Berkeley professor. Yeah. Uh, it, it's not Kahan, it's Khan. Uh-huh. And <laughs> so it's exactly the Wrath of Khan. Yes. Every time anybody comes out with an idea to fix floating-point arithmetic, 
he writes a, a ferocious article showing how all the ways that, that they've messed things up and made them even worse than floats. Because he was very careful in, in leading the IEEE 754 standard to be as good as it possibly could be. But you got to remember, um, if, if you go back to the mid-60s, uh, the cost of four transistors was about the same as the cost of putting a new set of tires on your car. Can for, you believe that? For four transistors. Four transistors replace all your tires on your car. About the same cost. <laughs> now imagine what kind of circuits you're going to build if you if, an, if a transistor costs as much as a tire. Yeah. It's yeah. you're going to you know be really really careful with them. Yes. And now we've got transistors that cost uh, just unbelievably small amounts of money. I, I guess it's probably in the trillions of a penny for some for some transistors. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, is, and we're we're still acting like they're really really precious, and you have to be careful of how you spend them. The floating point unit on a typical chip is less than a quarter of a square millimeter in size. Now, it's just almost you can't even see it. It's, right. it's getting smaller than the period at the end of a sentence. And we're worried about using too many transistors. It's just silly. Hmm. So, the unum idea is going to take more transistors, but they will typically not be as many used at a time, uh, but uh, you know sparingly. And uh, the overall effect is going to be faster execution and much less memory motion. So it's exactly what you want. You want to put more burden on the CPU and less on the memory bandwidth. And so it accomplishes that. So I think, uh, yeah, I was excited. I think I talked to you just after August 13th, 2013, when I finished the environment and, and actually was able to take it out for a spin. Yep. And the first thing I wanted to know is, uh, can Unum survive the wrath of Khan? Because <laughs> he's got all these counterexamples that break everybody else's number system. You know, they're mm -hmm. designed to show terrible answers when you plug in your ideas. So on the next page, I've got a typical challenge. And actually, it wasn't Khan that, that came up with this. Um, it was a French researcher, but he's, he's the one who's often quoted for it. And you, you have this small, it's just a one-liner program that you can define, and you, you try it for different values of x. And the correct answer is 1 no matter what. Yeah. And sometimes, for some real numbers, you get, you get 1. But most of the time, if you put like IEEE 32-bit numbers in there, you get zeros. Zero. It's about as different a number as you could get. Yeah. OK, so try it again with 64 bits, and you get 0. Fail. Uh, <laughs> There's an old adage that you just, if you want to know something is correct, you just do it in double precision. If you get the same answer, then your single precision answer is right. Mm -hmm. But here's a good counterexample to that. So it's a myth that you can just increase the precision and get the same answer to prove, uh, to, to get, uh, to do a kind of a poor man's numerical method. So you even try quad precision, and you still get zeros. Yeah. And unbelievably, yeah, there's something in, in JavaScript uh, or Java that's called, uh, you know, what is that, big decimal? Yes. Yeah. And you can try that, and even they, with hundreds and hundreds of, of significant digits, get the wrong answer on this. Hmm. So I, let's bring out interval arithmetic to the rescue. And I tried that, and guess yeah. what I got? Somewhere between minus infinity and infinity. <laughs> <laughs> Another epic fail for interval arithmetic. Yeah. So I said, well, I, I know it'll never work, but let's try those four-bit Worrell Peary numbers that I came up with. Yeah and see what they say. And on, I just fell off my chair because it got one, 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 one correct hmm. because they are completely honest about what they know, what they don't know, which side of zero you're on, yeah. the difference between an open interval and a closed interval, which is exactly what makes this example break. And on the average, I only used six bits per number. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I think I'm onto something. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. So I tried on a bunch of con problems, and I could not find anything where his uh, his acid test would break my my math. There's something on the next page that's a graphical version, and find the minimum of this function that's got a, a log in it, but it mostly looks like x squared plus one. And so you plot that, and even with a half a million double precision IEEE floating point numbers, it shows that the minimum is probably around x equals 0 0.8. See that over there on the left? Yeah. But there's that, that funny little dip there. And even with half a million points, it doesn't look like it's anything to worry about if you didn't think too hard about the function. Well, actually, what happens is when, when you hit the number four-thirds, you're taking the log of zero. Uh, mm. But four-thirds, you can't get very close to it with floats because that's not a representable number. So what happens when you try it with unums? And I just used like 
30 unums or something like that. Yeah. Very low precision. And right at the point where it spans four-thirds, it, it recognizes that it goes to minus infinity, and you wouldn't make that mistake mm-hmm. over on the right. So it's something like uh, several tens of thousands less effort to get the right answer with unums in this case than it is with floating point numbers. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Spinning the wheels, uh, as we would say, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> if, it, if it's not worth doing, it's not worth doing right. well. not worth doing. <laughs> sure. So um, uh, there's this statement all over the web about taking the power of a number, y to the w power. I, I guess Khan uses y and w because x looks too much like a multiply symbol. But he says no one knows how to do that. And I saw this quote on the web after I'd solved the problem, and it was I'd already written a chapter in the book on it. <laughs> so yeah. I was kind of surprised to see that quotation in the web. And I started, he and I had been going back and forth with email. Yeah. Uh, and he was very, very cordial, very helpful. And uh, he sent me back what he thought was a, a reference to a, a very good way to compute y to the w. He thought it was the, the best way out there. I said, well, can you do this? And I sent him this example with, you see, this 15 decimal number to the power of 0.875 is another 15 decimal number. Yeah. I said, that, that's exact. Mm-hmm. So if you did that with your method, wouldn't it say it was a rounded answer? And it's not. <laughs> it's sort of like the, the joke about you ask an engineer, what's 2 times 3? And they pull out a slide rule. And after a couple seconds, they say, it's about 6.0. <laughs> <laughs> It's not about anything. It's exactly six. It's exactly. Well, that's yeah. the, another problem with floats. They don't know when they've got the exact answer. And for some reason, yeah. that was the last time I heard from him. He has not been emailing me since. So I'm, I'm afraid my dialogue has ceased, and I'm really sorry to see that because uh, I couldn't have done any of this without his help. Yeah. I really learned numerical analysis from William Kahn, starting from using his HP design calculators. He, he, he did a lot of the algorithms for the early Hewlett-Packard scientific calculators, the handheld ones from the uh, 70s on. Oh, sure, sure. That's, that's the industry standard for forever. Yep. Yeah. Wow. So I'll, I think I'll just flip through these next slides quick because okay. I, I know we're taking a while. But I, I said, two can play this game, Professor K. <laughs> yeah. So I gave him an example that I can solve easily with unums, and he can't solve it with floating point. And uh, if you get just this little bit of wobble in the uh, the place where they intersect, mm-hmm. his, his fixed point methods fall apart badly. But if you want to use unums to imitate floating point arithmetic because you think you can do something with them, then they can because all you have to do is use the guess function. Mm-hmm. And a, the guess function applied to a unum does exactly the rounding that it would do if it were a float. Mm-hmm. And it's very easy to convert a unum back to a float. You just throw away a lot of the extra information, and what's left is a float. So they are a superset, and they're a superset in the way they behave, too. But you don't have to do that. So mm-hmm. if you wanted to convert a big code to run with unum arithmetic, you could start out by doing exactly the same operations and gradually try to remove the guessing and eventually wind up with a code that was rigorous, and yeah. you could do it one step at a time. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, there's a guy named uh, Siegfried Rump. I talk about Rump's royal pain uh, because you get, once again, almost the same answer in various precisions. Yeah. And it's like 1.17. And with IEEE double precision, I got 1.18 times 10 to the 21st. I don't know where the 10 21st came from, but Hmm. wildly wrong. The correct answer is actually negative 0.8 something. So you don't even get the correct sign. Yeah. 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 The wrong side of zero. Interesting. (laughs) Yeah. So I, yeah, I tried it with unums, and I got the right answer with to 23 decimals with the 75 five bits per number, and it found the decimals. It found the size to use automatically. I didn't have to tell it. Mm-hmm. It just searched for it, and it raised the exponent size, it raised the fraction side, reduced them when it could, yeah. and came out with the answer. Yeah, uh, that's the way computing should be. Everything adjusted automatically. Huh. So. so Fundamental principles is you bound the answer as tightly as possible and within the numerical environment, or else you say, I don't know how to do this problem. You don't guess anymore. Mm-hmm. We've got a lot of mathematical uh, stuff that says, oh, this is order h to the n power error, like when you do a differential equation. But you don't know what the error is. You just know it's the order of something and that it'll get better if you make the, uh, the spacing smaller. Mm-hmm. So I can actually do much better than that with a really precise bound that, that says how big the error is and measure that. And I, I count information as the reciprocal of the error bound size. 
So if you define it that way, then it doesn't matter how you get the answer. It's how well can you bound it. And now you could talk about information per second and information per bit and information per watt. You finally got a measure of what we're actually computing in terms of knowledge instead of what activities are we doing, like how many flops per second are we doing. Yeah. That's why I just don't think we need exascale computers. It's not to do flops. We need exascale computers to give us better answers, but not flops. Right. It, right. Yeah. <laughs> I, exactly. All right. I've got an example with polynomials. You know, it'd be nice to be able to do polynomials right. Mm -hmm. You try that with an interval arithmetic, and they they slop all over. Those gold rectangles I show there are where they produce a bigger bound than they should. And all you're doing is just a quadratic. Mm -hmm. And if you use, even if you could do it perfectly, because they've got closed endpoints, they're including a bunch of regions that you don't want. So when I use them with unums, they give exact answers when, you know, negative 2 squared is exactly 4, for example. Mm -hmm. And so it, it doesn't land on a range near 4, but... It's very, very careful about the stuff in between negative two and negative one and a half, mm -hmm. and it never lands on four, and it never lands on two negative two point, uh, positive two point two five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's another example on the next page of a sloppy uh, polynomial and a unum polynomial valuation there, and two two colors of magenta. So this is the, the what we've always wanted was math that we can actually trust on a computer. Now, I'm running out of time here. I don't really want to necessarily go into U-boxes, but this is the really the, the way to do scientific computing is to treat all of your answer as a multidimensional set of intervals that are one unit in last place wide. And what you get is massive amounts of parallelism when you do that. But that's exactly what we've got. We've got <laughs> lots of data parallelism. Yeah? Yes. Okay. And uh, my calculus considered harmful slides because... Calculus and, and computers really make kind of strange bedfellows. They, computers are discrete numbers, yep. stores, and calculus is continuous and, and, for many people, hard to understand. And it, that just ensures that you're going to get into trouble because you try to like, take a derivative on a computer, and there's no derivative operation on a computer. So you right. use differences instead, and it's wrong. As it's changing the problem to fit the tool. We've got a lot of wonderful mathematical machinery and calculus, but you don't have to do things that way. You can actually keep things in discrete form, solve the discrete form on the computer, and let the discrete intervals get as small as possible, but never give up exactness. Never go to the approximation in the limits that calculus wants you to use. Mm -hmm. So on the next page, I've got a, how the error bounds are so unsatisfying that just trying to just bound the value of pi on a quarter, by using a quarter circle. Mm -hmm. And, well, if you try to use the standard textbook error bound, it's got that expression there shown in the, with the orange background, and you really don't know what that Greek letter C is. It's somewhere in the interval, and you don't necessarily know how to find the second derivative. There might not even be a second derivative, so that's not much of a bound. Yeah. And so <laughs> I, I got no bound, which means I really have no information. But if you use the U-box method... There's two methods called the paint bucket method and the, uh, the try the universe method, which means try everything. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually bound the quarter circle example without knowing anything. It's just no expertise at all. It's just a really brute force, dumb method that makes use of the power of the computer. Hmm. And I've got some pictures here. I, I'm flipping through my slides really quick. Uh, I, I've got, I'm up to set is connected, need a seed at this point. And that's mm -hmm. where you start with just one point there, shown in green, surrounded by some amber trial boxes. Yep. And you test them, and the ones that turned red do not satisfy the equation. The ones that turn kind of blue-green are okay. It's just like the, the color of a go light and a traffic light. And there's, I've not calculated uh, square root of 1 minus x squared. I just tried to see if it satisfies x squared plus y squared equals 1 to the precision we have to compute with. Mm -hmm. So now you use that to make another trial set. And it grows across all the way until it completes the quarter circle. It looks like a fuse burning. It's very cool to watch on a screen. And now I've got all these green U-boxes that tell me exactly what is the shape of the quarter circle. So if you were sending this to a graphics processor, like to, you send it to a frame buffer, it, it turns out you could send, uh, after you've coalesced on the next slide, you've got to show the compressed final result. It's like six times uh, fewer bits than what we use to send to a frame buffer right now. So this could really accelerate all the uh, graphics in the world and the video gaming and so on. So instead of the units of least precision, the ULP, 
being the source of error is actually what we're computing with. It's the atomic unit of computation. I can do stuff like solve fifth-degree polynomials, which is, of course, analytically there is no solution. Numerically, there's lots of errors from rounding, but I plug in a nasty polynomial like this that gets really close to the axis, and it gives me exactly minus one and exactly two as the exact as the solutions. And it, it's just kind of like being a kid in a candy store and you've got a tool that's powerful. All the methods that you wished would work just do, finally. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's really the, the power of open-closed endpoints. Uh, just a couple examples from classical numerical analysis where you use time steps to estimate force. Sometimes it's called particle pushing. You know, you go through time step, time step, time step, and each time you're guessing the new velocity and the new acceleration. And you accumulate rounding and sampling error, both of them not exactly known. And it might be really far away from the actual behavior, which I show in green. The worst thing is you can't do it in parallel. Hmm. So what I found was a way to do all those kinds of calculations in parallel with space steps instead of time steps. You bound the acceleration and the velocity, and you can compute all of them at once. I don't have time to go into it here, but it's massively parallel even when you're doing an ordinary differential equation with like one degree of freedom. I don't think anyone ever saw that one coming. Hmm. And you can, yeah, it's, it's critical to be able to do this with, with U-boxes. I, I did have a chapter on pendulums done right. They teach you it's a harmonic oscillator. Yep. <laughs> and well, that's the fit. That's just the fit calculus. It's not a harmonic oscillator. It's an approximation. It's only a harmonic oscillator if it has almost zero amplitude swings. And everybody who's ever used a playground swing knows that's not the way it works. Right. Right. So if you really solve it with uh, with unums, you get the physical truth versus the force fit solution used to fit calculus. And you can see the orange is the what they tell you when you're first taking first taking physics is the answer, but without using any calculus and any any real sophisticated concepts, but just using the computer and and basic principles of of time and motion, uh, I got lower and, and upper bounds there that 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 show the real value for uh, starting with a big swing like a, a sixty degree swing. So there I found in many examples like this that I go into detail it. So you can get the right answer for the first time with less effort and without having to even use calculus. Linear solvers are another example like that. It doesn't even have to be linear. It works on nonlinear problems too. Uh, the, the correct answer to a set of two equations and two unknowns is shown with those bright green boxes. And the red boxes on the outside are places where it definitely does not uh, meet the right answer. And like that little tiny black dot in the center is what a floating point calculation would tell you. And it would only give you one of the, effectively, one of the answers, when it's really a region that solves the problem for a given precision. That gray rectangle on the outside, that's what you get with interval arithmetic, really approximate. And so you can see that with these U-boxes, you get the absolute best possible answer for a given amount of finite precision on a computer. I've done this with, uh, I've got some other examples in this, I'm getting close to the end here. Apps with uh, U-Box solutions are uh, photorealistic computer graphics, end body problems, structural analysis, even a perfect gas model that doesn't use statistical mechanics. So finally, we can actually have provable bounds on all these simulations instead of having guesses. So in revisiting those big challenges from the beginning, too much energy and power, I've found I can cut the main energy hog, which is the data transfers, by about half. More hardware parallels than we know how to use. Well, with U-boxes, you've got uh, all the parallels you could possibly want. You can dial it up and down according to the accuracy you want. It gives you that trade-off dial. As for not enough bandwidth, well, the, we use more CPU transistors to reduce the amount of memory, so that improves the ratio now. It goes the, finally the right direction. Rounding error is being treacherous. No more rounding error. Automat- automate the precision choice. And uh, multi-core methods, well, we got algebraic laws back, so you can do things in any order and still get the right answer. So it allows you to really parallelize things you couldn't parallelize before. So as for the sampling errors in uh, physics simulations, uh, I can take the guesswork and put provable bounds on them, and the bounds do not grow exponentially like they do with interval arithmetic. And the numerical methods being hard to use, well, I've got just two methods, and they both work, uh, paint bucket and try the universe, you might have a choice between which one's faster, and that's about it, but they both work. So, finally, uh, the book is out as of like 10 days ago. It's called The End of Error, Unum Computing. 
And I've got the link there for the CRC Press uh, site. It's also on Amazon. But this is a, a very much aimed at the general reader. I mean, all you need is high school math. And it's, it's I say, lots of illustrations, lots of figures. It took me about 6,000 hours to write this book. I started many, many years ago, but really didn't get the fundamental breakthrough until August 2013. Um, and, of course, as I said, you get the complete prototype environment. That's for free. The, they're not charging for that, and you don't have to buy the book to get it. Yeah, yeah. What the, this, is, this is awesome. So, so, John, what would it take to build a Unum-based computer? Would you have to rewrite the logic, or can the compilers do this? Or I think there's a, is that the you do it in approach? steps. Yeah. So yeah. I've, got the, I've got a high-level prototype that demonstrates mathematically how it should behave. The next yeah. step is to build a, like a C library or a C++ library. Mm -hmm. And uh, get down to the uh, that would specify every single shift and and and, and or operation you n need to make logic do these things. Mm -hmm. Just the way they used to simulate floating point when you didn't have floating point, you'd actually have to write a library to do the the operations. Yeah. And once you've got C, then you can start thinking about building an FPGA that does those things and see if it actually gets you some acceleration for the, uh, the these kinds of operations. And maybe it'll be a little slower than hardware floats. Mm -hmm. But because you've got the assurance of the value of the accuracy of the answer without the explosion of interval arithmetic, you still might want to use that. And the last step is somebody says, you know, why don't we just make this the basic data type inside the processor? Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of my book talks about how you build hardware for Unum arithmetic, how you ac can make this real. And um, I, I can't wait to get started, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's 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 say we've done all that, John. I mean, you want to build a, mm -hmm. you know, an X type machine with that kind of capability, uh, mm -hmm. because you've got all those uh, energy uh, parameters and everything. You've got to meet those requirements. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it it seems odd, but wouldn't this be the the good place to start? Do you think? Well, we need to start right away because yeah. we're trying to make it to an X scale <laughs> machine by twenty whatever. Yes, and pick the number. Um, I, I hate to see that we get there and we realize that a lot of it was wasted just trying to do IEEE 64-bit floating point operations as fast as possible. Right. When we, what we really needed was like five decimals in the answer. Let the computer worry about how to get it. And, so, and, yeah, I, I, absolutely. And so we've talked about how you might go about uh, you know, implementing this, but what about community? John, you, you put this out there for people, right? Uh, yes. It's, you've made it understandable with high school level math. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think are the next steps for, for building, you know, uh, a group of people that can go out and start carrying the message? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question, and I, I don't necessarily know the answer. I don't want to dictate the answer. Yeah. I, I hope that a cottage industry uh, springs up of people trying to build their own libraries, and because I, I doubt that we'll get it right the first time we do it, mm -hmm. and they will... There's a few choices to make, not as many as there are with like an IEEE standard. Uh, it, it's much more like programming with integers. You just, just, there's one way to do it, and it's the right way. Mm -hmm. So, but as as people find better ways to interface it to existing languages, yeah. then I think we'll it will guide the, it'll guide the way forward. And I'm happy to help anybody who wants to to create such an effort. I know of at least two uh, appeals to government for government grants to put unims into a, a more real. Uh, uh, put them on a real <laughs> hardware ground, right. and uh, eventually, I think it's going to happen because it's it's just a good idea. Yeah. Uh, I think it takes about ten years to go from having a good idea to actually people using it in general. <laughs> sure. That's what I've seen historically. I don't think we have we haven't changed that much uh, over technological history that we are adopting things any faster. It, it'll just take a while. It'll take time. Yeah. Well, well, John, this has been fascinating, and I, I'd like to thank you once again for uh, coming on the show today. I really appreciate the chance to come on. Thanks, Britt. You bet. You bet. Okay, okay, folks, that's it for the Rich Report. Stay tuned for more news and information on high-performance computing.